Chapter 21 Global Shelter One of the first tasks of Yuri Chcherbak, the former head of Green World, Ukraine's first ecological organization, upon his appointment as Ukraine's ambassador to the United States in the fall of 1994, was to organize a state visit of the Ukrainian president to Washington to discuss nuclear issues. Shcherbak had been the first deputy of the Soviet parliament to deliver the news about Ukrainian independence to that body in August 1991. He considered it the happiest moment of his life. He had gone on to serve as Ukraine's first Minister of Ecology in 1991-1992, but then joined the diplomatic service, becoming ambassador first to Israel and then to the United States. His departure from the Ukrainian political scene in 1992 coincided with the decline of the ecological movement in his country and in the entire post-Soviet space. The former territory of the Soviet Union now claimed by fifteen independent republics. Ukraine and all the other parts of the former Soviet Union were experiencing both a huge decline in GDP and out-of-control inflation. Moreover, in Russia, a political conflict that produced a constitutional crisis in the fall of 1993 was resolved only after the military, loyal to President Boris Yeltsin, crushed a revolt led by the vice president and the head of parliament. In Ukraine, early presidential elections in 1994 brought to power a new leader, the 56-year-old rocket scientist Leonid Kuchma, formerly the director of Europe's largest missile factory. He promised economic reform and asked for American and Western assistance. The West was responsive, but Western leaders wanted Ukraine to give up its nuclear arsenal, Kuchma would be going to Washington to discuss the conditions under which his country might do so. Shcherbak had his work cut out for him. The ecological activist found himself plunged into nuclear arms negotiations. When the Soviet Union fell apart in December 1991, Ukraine inherited 1,800 nuclear warheads that had been deployed with Soviet armed forces stationed there and agreed to dismantle and send them to Russia. Ukraine was supposed to complete the task by the end of 1994, but parliamentarians in Kiev soon put forward a number of conditions, including monetary compensation for weapons-grade uranium in the nuclear warheads. After the U.S. government promised financial aid, the Ukrainians agreed to get rid of their nuclear arsenal, the third largest in the world, after those of the United States and Russia. The agreement on the transfer of weapons was signed in January 1994, but the Ukrainian parliament asked for guarantees of territorial integrity and security after the weapons left its territory. What it got in return were legally non-binding assurances. In November 1994, a few days before his planned visit to Washington, Kuchma finally convinced parliament to accept the deal security assurances and financial assistance in return for giving up the nuclear weapons. President Bill Clinton was happy to welcome the Ukrainian president to Washington on November 22, 1994. Kuchma was greeted with a 16-gun salute and compared to President Franklin D. Roosevelt, who had led America at a time of economic hardship, a reference to the deep economic crisis in Ukraine and the rest of the post-Soviet space. Clinton praised Kuchma's courage in removing the threat of nuclear weapons and laying the groundwork for an era of peace. The United States was providing Ukraine with an aid package of up to $200 million. A few weeks later, on December 5, 1994, Clinton and Kuchma put their signatures to the Budapest Memorandum, a document that provided security assurances from the United States, Russia and Britain, against threats or use of force against Ukraine, as well as against Kazakhstan and Belarus, two other post-Soviet states that were giving up their Soviet-era nuclear arsenals. China and France would provide their own assurances in a separate protocol. Ukraine and other post-Soviet states joined the Nuclear Weapons Non-Proliferation Treaty as non-nuclear states. In the long run, the deal turned out to be disastrous for Ukraine. Twenty years later, in March 2014, 
nuclear-free Ukraine became an object of aggression by one of the signatories of the Budapest Memorandum when Russia, now led by President Vladimir Putin, annexed Ukraine's Crimea and unleashed a hybrid war in Ukraine's eastern Donbass region. The Ukrainian parliament appealed to the signatories of the Budapest Memorandum, but did not get very far, as the memorandum did not require any military action on the part of the signatories. The United States and its European allies limited their response to introducing economic sanctions against Russia. It was too little, too late to reverse Russia's aggression and restore Ukraine's territorial integrity. It all looked very different at the time of the signing of the agreements in 1994. Ukraine received significant diplomatic endorsement, financial assistance, and assurance that in return for the nuclear warheads, Russia would continue to provide fuel for Ukraine's nuclear plants, including the one in Chernobyl, all of which ran on Russian-produced enriched uranium. The Chernobyl plant received considerable attention in the Washington negotiations of November 1994 between Kuchma and Clinton. President Clinton drew attention to the significant resource commitments and to the importance of receiving early assurances that the Chernobyl reactors would be shut down read the statement. The United States wanted Ukraine to stick to its parliamentary decision of 1990 to shut down the Chernobyl plant by 1995, but Ukraine, faced with a deepening economic crisis, had since reversed its decision and wanted the plant to run indefinitely. According to the same joint statement, Kuchma refused to budge under pressure from the American president. Instead, he merely assured President Clinton that Ukraine takes seriously the international community's concerns about the continued operation of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. He pointed to the need for minimizing the social impact on the plant's personnel and ensuring that sufficient economically priced electricity is available to meet Ukraine's domestic needs. Clinton got the message. Cash-strapped Ukraine could not afford to lose two working nuclear reactors in Chernobyl unless it received financial compensation. The two presidents agreed to work on those issues together with the members of the G7 group of the world's largest economies. The primary responsibility for the safety of nuclear reactors lay with the countries that owned them, but the G7 governments of the world's richest economies instructed the World Bank and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, EBRD, where they established the Nuclear Safety Account in 1993 to accumulate funds designed to help the Eastern European countries still using Soviet-era reactors to ensure their safety, along with other institutions, to work on the issue. The directors of the nuclear power companies in the West were in a panic. Another accident in the East could damage the reputation of nuclear power in the West beyond repair and potentially put them out of business. They lobbied their governments to launch a program for upgrading Eastern European reactors using Western technology and money. Armed with new technology and backed by government funds, Western nuclear firms took steps to ensure that another major nuclear accident would not happen in the East. Despite the handsome financial incentives and political pressure from the West, the Ukrainian government continued to drag its feet. The economy was in freefall, and high inflation had eaten up the savings of the population, making the situation serious enough for the G7 summit in Naples to include a special section on the Ukrainian economy in its official communique of August 1994. The Ukrainian government argued that it could not simply shut down a power plant that produced up to 6% of the country's electrical energy. That would result in a layoff of personnel in the midst of an economic crisis whose severity not only paralleled but almost dwarfed the Great Depression of the 1930s. Kiev would give up its nuclear arms but would not budge on Chernobyl. To the rest of the world this seemed incomprehensible. The young nation was among those that had suffered the most from the accident, Nevertheless, it was not only keeping the rest of its nuclear plants and reactors in operation, but also refusing to close a plant in a highly contaminated zone that presented a significant risk to the operating personnel. And beside the operating reactors in Chernobyl was the deteriorating sarcophagus 
which, as Kuchma told Clinton in November 1994, was in need of repair. The Western governments would not give up. The European Union indicated how seriously it took the situation when it suspended $85 million in economic assistance to Ukraine unless progress was made on the closure of the Chernobyl power plant. Badly in need of money, Kuchma announced in April 1995, in time for his meeting with an EU and G7 delegation, led by the French Minister of the Environment, Michel Barnier, that he was committed to closing down the plant. But his officials, including Sergei Parashin, party secretary of the Chernobyl plant at the time of the 1986 accident, and now its director, were sceptical. Speaking to television reporters, Parashin complained about political pressure from the West, claiming that his personnel knew for certain that the Chernobyl station was no less safe than any other in Ukraine. For Parashin and his subordinates, the proposed closure of the plant meant the prospect of personal economic disaster, the loss of wages and salaries that were high by Ukrainian standards, making it possible to survive in the new market economy with its extremely high prices. Workers remained at the plant even though they absorbed high doses of radiation, information that they withheld from their doctors. They hang on to the zone, said a local doctor to an American graduate student conducting research on the consequences of the Chernobyl disaster. As long as they were employed by the Chernobyl plant, engineers and workers could pay their bills. If it were closed, they would end up on the street. The leaders of the G7 countries tried to find money to deal with the economic and social rehabilitation of the Chernobyl workers. Recognizing the economic and social burden that the closure of Chernobyl will place on Ukraine, we will continue efforts to mobilize international support for appropriate energy production, energy efficiency, and nuclear safety projects for Ukraine read the communique issued by the Western leaders in Halifax, Canada, in June 1995. Any assistance for replacement power for Chernobyl will be based on sound economic, environmental and financial criteria. Western experts opposed the construction of a new gas-fired power station in the contaminated area, a project advocated by the Ukrainian government and let their Ukrainian counterparts know that they could not count on an unlimited line of credit. Money would be available only for projects approved by Western institutions. In December 1995, representatives of the G7, the European Union and Ukraine, signed a memorandum that promised Western assistance for the decommissioning of the Chernobyl plant, coupled with money for completing the construction of two reactors at other Ukrainian plants, and the reconstruction of a number of coal-fired electrical power stations to offset the loss of energy caused by the closure of Chernobyl. The Ukrainian government hoped to get $4.4 billion for those programs, but Western governments and financial institutions pledged $2.3 billion instead. Of that sum, Close to half a billion was to come in the form of grants for the closure of plants, and $1.8 billion as credits for the construction of new reactors at the Khmelnytsky and Rivna nuclear power plants in western Ukraine. Chernobyl had to be shut down by the year 2000. The December 1995 memorandum did precious little to eliminate persisting tensions between representatives of Ukraine and its Western donors. Ukrainian government officials complained that the grant portion of the deal was too small, and that the Western powers had almost entirely neglected the question of building a new shelter above Unit 4. International institutions and Western countries, as well as Japan in the Far East, were reluctant to deliver funds for the construction of the two additional nuclear reactors. Experts from the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, one of the main funders of Chernobyl-related projects, argued that it was more cost-effective to upgrade existing reactors than to build new ones. Besides, they argued, because of the economic crisis, the Ukrainian economy was consuming much less energy than before, Industry needed less energy, and additional energy sources would make it less urgent to reform the country's energy market or introduce energy-saving measures.
anti-nuclear non-governmental organizations, NGOs, in the West endorse that idea. But President Kuchma and his officials insisted that the Chernobyl plant would not be closed until the additional two reactors were built and became operational. Many in the West thought he was bluffing. This perception grew stronger when, after long procrastination, Ukraine shut down Unit 1 in the fall of 1996. In June 1997, Unit 3 was closed for maintenance. Given that Unit 2 was not reactivated after the fire in the fall of 1991, the entire station had in fact been non-operational since the summer of 1997. It looked as if the Ukrainians had shut it down without waiting for funds to build the other two reactors. But the Ukrainian nuclear industry did not give up on Chernobyl. In October 1997, it solemnly marked the plant's 20th anniversary. When the former director, Viktor Bruchanov, came to the podium to address the gathering of plant workers, he was met with a standing ovation. The whole auditorium rose. They applauded so loudly that my ears rang, recalled Bruchanov's wife, Valentina. To show that they were serious about the continuing operation of the plant, Ukrainian officials restarted the reactor of Unit 3 and reconnected it to the grid in June 1998, claiming that it could work safely until 2010. The Ukrainian government then turned to Russia for help in completing the construction of the two reactors in western Ukraine that the West was reluctant to fund. Ukraine's sudden eastward turn petrified western governments, which now faced the possibility that the Chernobyl power plant would go on operating indefinitely, putting safety standards at other Ukrainian nuclear plants into question and threatening the commercial interests of Western companies that hoped to get the job of completing the two reactors Ukraine had asked for. The West, however, was anything but united. The French and Finnish governments, lobbied by the leaders of their nuclear industries, indicated their readiness to complete the construction of the two reactors. But the German government was hampered by a parliamentary resolution adopted under pressure from the Green Party that prohibited funding of nuclear-related projects. Despite opposition in Germany and a number of other countries, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development decided on December the 7th, 2000, to provide a $250 million loan for the construction of the two Ukrainian reactors. The bank's decision opened the door for a loan of more than $500 million from the European Commission. Chernobyl could now finally be closed. On December the 15th, 2000, eight days after the EBRD decision, President Kuchma officially announced the decommissioning of the Chernobyl nuclear plant. In a speech delivered in Kiev on the occasion of the closure, he assured the world that there would be no further nuclear threat from Ukraine. He then added, We believe that Ukraine will not find it necessary to repent of the decision it has made. The decision was highly controversial in Ukraine itself. Ten days earlier, Parliament had voted to extend the operation of Unit 3 into 2011 to deal with increased demand for electricity during the winter. The head of the powerful communist faction in Parliament declared that the closure of the Chernobyl power station was not a policy decision but a purely political one directed to the detriment of the country's national interests. But the brunt of criticism came from the personnel of the power plant. On the eve of the closure, when Kuchma visited Unit 3 in the company of the Prime Ministers of Russia and Belarus, as well as the US Energy Secretary Bill Richardson, the personnel, dressed in white as usual, put on black armbands as a sign of sorrow and protest against the decision. Alexander Novikov, then head of the Department of Nuclear Safety at the plant, later recalled, On that day, the emotional state of those in the control room of Unit 3 was very depressed. Men who had gone through fire, water and copper pipes were sobbing, and I'm not afraid to admit that there was a feeling of confusion. I myself had no idea what I would do next. The other feeling was resentment. The third element was emotional emptiness, because it was all done with some kind of indecent enthusiasm, boisterously, one might even say festively,
but in my view the black armbands worn by the staff in charge of operations put everything in its place as far as our attitude to that event was concerned. Opponents of the closure claimed that the power plant had been upgraded with regard to technology and safety, and could continue working successfully until the year 2011, earning hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue for the electrical energy produced, while the completion of the replacement reactors at the Khmelnytsky and Rivna nuclear plants was nowhere in sight. Indeed, they would not be finished and connected to the grid until 2004. But one way or another, with the closure on December the 15th, 2000, the saga of the Chernobyl power plant was over. The world was entering the new millennium without Chernobyl, but much of the plant's legacy remained. Russia, Ukraine and Belarus, the three newly independent countries most affected by the Chernobyl disaster, estimated their overall losses from it in the hundreds of billions of dollars. In Ukraine alone, close to 38,000 square kilometers, approximately 5% of the country's entire territory, inhabited by up to 5% of its population of 54 million in 1991, were contaminated by the explosion. Even harder hit was Belarus, with more than 44,000 square kilometers of land severely contaminated, accounting for 23% of the republic's territory and 19% of its population. But of all the countries affected by Chernobyl, Russia had the largest contaminated area, close to 60,000 square kilometers. Given the country's size, that area constituted only 1.5% of its territory, with 1% of its population. All three countries had to bear the cost of resettlement and deal with the health problems caused by the disaster, not only among those residing in or resettled from the contaminated areas, but also among the hundreds of thousands of liquidators exposed to high doses of radiation in the first days, weeks and months after the explosion. In terms of immediate deaths attributable to the accident, the Chernobyl nuclear disaster turned out to be anything but a highly destructive force, whereas the nuclear bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki claimed close to 200,000 immediate victims, more than 100,000 killed and the rest injured, the Chernobyl explosion caused two immediate deaths and 29 deaths from acute radiation sickness in the course of the next three months. Altogether, 237 people were airlifted from Chernobyl to Moscow and treated in the special clinic there. Out of these, 134 showed symptoms of acute radiation syndrome. It has been claimed that a total of 50 people died of acute radiation syndrome and that 4,000 may die in the future of radiation-related causes. But the ultimate Chernobyl mortality toll, though difficult to estimate, may yet turn out to be significantly higher. Current estimates place it between the 4,000 deaths estimated by United Nations agencies in 2005 and the 90,000 suggested by Greenpeace International. In Ukraine, in the first five years after the disaster, cases of cancer among children increased by more than 90%. During the first 20 years after the accident, approximately 5,000 cases of thyroid cancer were registered in Russia, Ukraine and Belarus, among those who were younger than 18 at the time of the explosion. The World Health Organization estimates that approximately 5,000 cancer deaths were related to the Chernobyl accident, but this figure is often challenged by independent experts. In Ukraine in 2005, 19,000 families were receiving government assistance owing to the loss of a breadwinner whose death was deemed to be related to the Chernobyl accident. Other consequences include genetic damage to people born after the disaster. Scientists are particularly concerned about cases of microsatellite instability, MSI, a condition that affects the ability of DNA to replicate and repair itself, which has been detected in children whose fathers were exposed to radiation after the accident. Similar changes were found earlier among children of Soviet soldiers who absorbed radiation during nuclear tests. The cost of the disaster was enormous, and all three East Slavic countries had to deal with it in one way or another. 
they adopted largely similar formulas, defining the most contaminated areas whose inhabitants were in need of resettlement or assistance, and then establishing categories of citizens who were considered to have been most severely affected, making them eligible for financial compensation and privileged access to medical facilities. Altogether, close to seven million people would receive some form of compensation for the effects of the Chernobyl fallout. But the size of the groups eligible for subsidies and the amount of financial compensation differed in the three states, depending on the interplay of politics and economic circumstances. Russia's oil and gas riches helped it deal with the post-Chernobyl crisis, while resource-poor Ukraine and Belarus had nothing comparable. Those two countries introduced a special Chernobyl tax in the early 1990s, amounting in Belarus to 18% of all wages paid in the non-agricultural sector. In general, however, the Belarusian government dealt with the enormous challenge by continuing the Soviet tradition of suppressing investigations of major disasters. Although Belarus was the post-Soviet country most affected by Chernobyl fallout, its anti-nuclear movement never attained the proportions of its Ukrainian counterpart. Nor did the Belarusian Popular Front exercise influence comparable to that of the Ukrainian Ruch. The Belarusian parliament and government lacked the political will and, more importantly, the resources to admit the full scope of the disaster and deal effectively with its consequences. In 1993, the Belarusian parliament adopted laws reducing the levels of soil contamination considered dangerous for human habitation. Even then, with significantly less territory and population covered by social welfare laws, the government only managed to allocate less than 60% of the funds approved by legislators for Chernobyl-related programs. When it comes to Western assistance, Ukraine got most of the attention and resources, largely because it inherited the Chernobyl nuclear plant and its devastated Unit 4. The first priority identified by Ukraine as requiring Western help after the closure of the Chernobyl plant was the construction of a new shelter over the sarcophagus that had been hastily built to cover the damaged fourth reactor in the first months after the explosion. The Ukrainian government announced an international competition for the construction of the new shelter in 1992. In June 1997, the G7 countries pledged $300 million toward the realization of the project, whose total cost was then estimated at $760 million. A special Chernobyl shelter fund was created at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development to collect the rest of the funds. That turned out to be a major challenge. Originally, it was expected that the new shelter would be built by 2005. But it was not until 2007 that the French Novaca Consortium, which included Vinci Construction, Grand Projet and Bouygues Construction, won the contract to erect a 30,000-ton sliding steel arch, 110 meters in height and 165 meters in length, with a span of 257 meters over the old sarcophagus. Construction of the arch, which had to endure for the next 100 years, began in 2010. The deadline for completion, originally scheduled for 2005, was later postponed to 2012 and then to 2013, 2015 and finally 2017. Its cost has been estimated at 1.5 billion euros with the total cost of the new safe confinement project exceeding 3 billion euros. It took nine years after the fall of the USSR to close the Chernobyl nuclear power station and more than a quarter century to build a new shelter over the damaged reactor. The international community emerged victorious in the contest of security priorities. Relations between the two main actors in the post-Chernobyl drama the Western funding agencies and the Ukrainian government were not unlike those in a family with a teenager who promises not to behave dangerously if given an ever larger allowance. Some scholars refer to it as environmental blackmail. But the closure of the Chernobyl power plant and the construction of the new shelter is more than just a story of nuclear extortion of funds by a poor country from rich ones.
More than anything else, it is a story of the clash between the demands of individual nations for economic development and the security of the world, as well as of the threat posed to the latter by the political and economic decline of the nuclear powers and the uncertain future of the post-imperial states. Moscow, the former capital of the empire responsible for the design and operation of the damaged reactor, disappeared behind the borders of the Russian Federation, leaving it to Ukraine and the international community to clean up the mess. But the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2014 brought the fighting within 322 kilometers of the city of Enerhodar, the site of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, Europe's largest, which operates six reactors. The war also interrupted the nuclear cycle whereby Ukraine received its nuclear fuel from Russia and sent its spent fuel back there. In 2016, Ukraine began the construction of its own spent fuel facility and declared plans to reduce its almost total dependence on Russian fuel by covering 40% of its needs with purchases from the US-based Westinghouse Electric Company. While the war and the disruption of the traditional nuclear cycle brought new challenges to the struggling Ukrainian economy, the nuclear industry of the land of Chernobyl took another important step away from its Soviet legacy. What remained unchanged and impervious to remedy by any amount of internal mobilization or outside assistance were the long-term consequences of the Chernobyl disaster. While the actual impact of radiation exposure on the health of the population is still debated, there can be little doubt that the society as a whole was left traumatized for decades to come. Every sixth Ukrainian adult reports being in poor health, a significantly higher percentage than its neighboring countries, and those affected by the Chernobyl radiation have lower levels of employment and fewer working hours than the rest of Ukraine's population. And then there is the environment. The new shelter over the damaged reactor number four notwithstanding, the area around the nuclear plant will not be safe for human habitation for at least another 20,000 years. In April 2016, when the world marked the 30th anniversary of the disaster, there was a temptation to breathe a sigh of relief. The half-life of cesium-137, one of the most harmful nuclides released during the accident, is approximately 30 years. It is the longest living isotope of cesium that can affect the human body through external exposure and ingestion. Other deadly isotopes present in the disaster have long passed their half-life stages. Iodine-131 after eight days and cesium-134 after two years. Cesium-137 is the last of that deadly trio of isotopes but the harmful impact of the accident is still far from over, with tests revealing that the cesium-137 around Chernobyl is not decaying as quickly as predicted, scholars believe that the isotope will continue to harm the environment for at least 180 years. The time required for half the cesium to be eliminated from the affected areas by weathering and migration. Other radionuclides will perhaps remain in the region forever, the half-life of plutonium-239, traces of which were found as far away as Sweden, is 24,000 years. Epilogue These days, European tour operators offer trips to Chernobyl from Brussels, Amsterdam or Berlin for under 500 euros. Visitors are promised safety, comfort and excitement while visiting the place where on April the 26th, 1986, the explosion at reactor number four ended one era and initiated another. The city of Pripyat and the exclusion zone as a whole is a time capsule. In 2015, in the wake of the Revolution of Dignity, the Ukrainian parliament voted to remove statues of Vladimir Lenin and other communist leaders from the country's streets and squares. Overnight, the exclusion zone became a communist preserve. The monument to Lenin still stands in the center of Chernobyl, and when the Ukrainian president visited the city on the 30th anniversary of the disaster, the authorities covered up a sign on the approach to the city that depicts the Order of Lenin. 
The sign is now painted in the Ukrainian national colors, blue and yellow. It was red back in 1986, when the entire Chernobyl nuclear plant was named after Vladimir Lenin. The new high-tech shelter over the old sarcophagus of reactor number four that visitors see on their trips to the exclusion zone stands today as a monument to the failed ideology and political system embodied in the Soviet Union. But it is also a warning to societies that put military or economic objectives above environmental and health concerns. In April and May 1986, the firefighters, scientists, engineers, workers, soldiers and police officers who found themselves caught in the nuclear Armageddon called Chernobyl did their best to put out the nuclear inferno. Some of them sacrificed their lives, many their health and well-being, in this effort. They tried astounding measures. They dropped thousands of tons of sand from helicopters onto the open reactor. They dug a tunnel with little more than their bare hands to freeze the land beneath it. They built dams along the river banks to prevent contaminated water from flowing into the Pripyat River and from there into the Dnieper, the Black Sea, the Mediterranean, and the Atlantic. These measures achieved the seemingly impossible. They put the reactor to sleep. But even today we do not know which of the strategies the Soviets tried and the technical solutions they implemented actually worked. Could some of them have made things worse? The eruption of the nuclear volcano stopped for reasons that the scientists and engineers could not comprehend, just as they were initially at a loss to explain why the reactor had exploded in the first place. Although the reason for the explosion was eventually discovered, we are still as far from taming nuclear reactions as we were in 1986. Unpredictable events keep happening, causing new nuclear disasters, like the one at Fukushima, Japan, in March 2011, when not one reactor, as at Chernobyl, but three sustained a partial meltdown of their cores and released radiation directly into the Pacific Ocean as a result of an earthquake followed by a tsunami. The world is growing bigger, but not safer. The planet's population was close to 5 billion in 1986. Today it numbers more than 7 billion, and it is projected to reach 10 billion by 2050. Every 12 to 14 years, the planet gains another billion residents. As the physical world shrinks for its growing population, its resources and energy reserves dwindle. As the population of Europe declines and that of North America shows only modest growth, Asia and Africa are expected to show dramatic increases, with the African population more than doubling by mid-century, reaching a total of over 2 billion. Thus, most of the globe's population growth will occur in countries already struggling to feed their hungry and replenish their sources of energy. Nuclear power seems to provide an easy way out of the growing demographic, economic and ecological crisis. Or does it? Most new reactors under construction today are being built outside the Western world, which is known for the relative safety of its reactors and operating procedures. A whopping 21 new reactors are under construction in China, plus 9 in Russia, 6 in India, 4 in the United Arab Emirates, and 2 in Pakistan. Five new reactors are currently being built in the United States, and none in Britain. The next great nuclear power frontier is Africa. Volatile Egypt is currently building two reactors, its first in history. Are we sure that all these reactors are sound? that safety procedures will be followed to the letter, and that the autocratic regimes running most of those countries will not sacrifice the safety of their people and the world as a whole to get extra energy and cash to build up their military, ensure rapid economic development, and try to head off public discontent. That is exactly what happened in the Soviet Union back in 1986. The immediate cause of the Chernobyl accident was a turbine test that went wrong but its deeper roots lay in the interaction between major flaws in the Soviet political system and major flaws in the nuclear industry. One such flaw at Chernobyl was the military origin of the nuclear power industry. In 
Chernobyl-type reactors had been adapted from the technology that had been created to produce nuclear bombs. Moreover, although it was volatile under certain physical conditions, the Chernobyl-type reactor had been pronounced safe. It was actively promoted by leaders of the Soviet military-industrial complex, who later refused to take responsibility for the disaster. Another flaw was the violation of procedures and safety rules by station personnel, who bought into the myth of the safety of nuclear energy and adopted a reckless, we-can-do-it-no-matter-what type of attitude. It was the same attitude that characterized the country's desperate attempts to catch up with the West in the economic and military spheres. Immediately after the accident, as panic spread, the authoritarian Soviet regime imposed control over the flow of information, endangering millions of people at home and abroad, and leading to innumerable cases of radiation poisoning that could otherwise have been avoided. Today, the chances of another Chernobyl disaster taking place are increasing as nuclear energy technology falls into the hands of rulers pursuing ambitious geopolitical goals and eager to accelerate economic development in order to overcome energy and demographic crises while paying lip service to ecological concerns. While world attention is focused on the non-proliferation of nuclear arms, an equally great danger looms from the mismanagement of atoms for peace in the developing world. The story of Chernobyl points to the need to strengthen international control over the construction and exploitation of nuclear power stations, as well as to develop new nuclear technologies, such as those now being explored by Bill Gates and his Terra Power Company, to produce cheaper, safer, and ecologically cleaner reactors. Investment in such research and development, with the clear understanding that financial benefits may be years if not decades away, is imperative if the world is to survive the current energy crisis and the continuing demographic boom. Is another nuclear Armageddon, like the one at Chernobyl, possible today? As the disaster receded in time, the loudest voices were those of optimists who denied such a possibility. Safety procedures at nuclear power plants have indeed improved. The old Soviet-era RBMK reactors have been decommissioned, and new reactors offer a level of safety that nuclear engineers could only have dreamed of in 1986. But then, a quarter century after Chernobyl, came Fukushima, the nuclear disaster of 2011 at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant indicated a different vulnerability of nuclear reactors. Future accidents, like those at Chernobyl or Fukushima, may have various causes. A lapse in personnel discipline, a fault in reactor design, or an earthquake. There is also the growing danger of terrorist attacks on nuclear plants, one such attempt was investigated by the Belgian authorities in March 2016. Cyber attacks by hackers are another danger, as evidenced by the one that shut down the Chernobyl radiation monitoring systems in June 2017. The Ukrainian authorities believe that it had originated in Russia. The decommissioning of the Chernobyl nuclear plant and the construction of a new sarcophagus over the damaged reactor helped to close the most tragic page in the history of the nuclear power industry. But it is still imperative that we draw the right lessons from the Chernobyl disaster. The most crucial lesson is the importance of counteracting the dangers posed by nuclear nationalism and isolationism, and of ensuring close international cooperation between countries developing nuclear projects. This lesson is especially important today, when the forces of populism, nationalism, and anti-globalism are finding more adherence in a world that relies increasingly on nuclear technology for the production of energy. The world has already been overwhelmed by one Chernobyl and one exclusion zone. It cannot afford any more. It must learn its lessons from what happened in and around Chernobyl on April the 26th, 1986. This audiobook was produced and published by Penguin Books Limited. Recording copyright 2019. Audible hopes you've enjoyed this program.